wherever you are and whenever you're watching this, welcome to online worship from the parish of Dunkeld. This week, once again, I've come back up to Amal Kirk to record the service. It's a lovely spot up in Strathbran, where in normal times we would have a service on the third Sunday of the month in the afternoon. Here, being surrounded by great big spaces and magnificent countryside, by a huge sky, your thoughts turn very easily to our place in the great scheme of things. It makes you very aware of your own smallness. We're just a pinprick on this map here, and yet tiny in terms of the universe. The writer of Psalm 8 contemplated the same kinds of questions when he wrote his poem. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swims the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So let us worship God. We begin today with a version of another psalm found at number 97 in the hymn book. O oh God, you search me and you know me. Let's pray. Gracious God, when we think of the many ways you have blessed us, our hearts fill with praise. You have been our shelter when storms have raged around us, our calming presence when storms raged within, our peace when all else has been in turmoil, our support in weakness, We try to express in words the gratitude we feel inside. 
and fail to do it justice. But before you, our lives are an open book. You can see what is inside. You know that we love you and that we want to honour you with our lives. You have blessed us and been good to us. So we give you praise. Nothing is hidden from your sight. You know too our weaknesses and vanities, our wandering thoughts, our stupid behaviour at times. Yet you see beyond what we are, to what we might be. Take away our guilt and shame for the mistakes we have made and strengthen us, Holy Spirit, to live in Christ's ways. May we walk with you, Lord, in ways of righteousness and truth until we take our place in your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, I want to tackle the nice, cheery subject of judgment. Perhaps we have in our mind's eye an image of days gone by when stern preachers with furrowed brow thundered about judgment and eternal damnation in churches and pulpits like this one, leaving the poor congregation, who already had a pretty tough life, quaking in their boots. I hope it won't come as a surprise to folk who know me that that, that's not the kind of line I want to take. Rather, starting from the story of Noah and his ark, I want to explore some of the issues raised there. And what set me thinking about this was the adoption of the symbol of the rainbow for the current pandemic that we're living through. A rainbow, as most people know, appears at the end of the story of Noah. And as you mull over that ancient tale, you begin to realise there are many elements there which resonate with what we are going through now. So this week and next week, I would like to use that as the basis for the services. It's too long to read the whole story in one go, so we're going to hear the the beginning of it in Genesis chapter 6, read from Eugene Peterson's version of the Bible, The Message. This is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and saw how bad it was. Everyone corrupt and corrupting. I'm making a clean sweep. Build yourself a ship from teak wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. Make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Build a roof for it and put in a window 18 inches from the top. Put in a door on the side of the ship and make three decks, lower, middle and upper. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. Total destruction. But I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You'll board the ship and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives will come on board with you. You are also to take two of each living creature, a male and a female, on board the ship to preserve their lives with you. Two of every species of bird, mammal and reptile. Two of everything, so as to preserve their lives along with yours. Also, get all the food you'll need and store it up for you and them. Noah did everything 
God commanded him to do. When our children were small, they had this toy Noah's Ark, which my brother-in-law made for them, along with uh, a series of animals going into the ark two by two, a bit of the story everybody knows. And they played with it a lot, and now our grandchildren are playing with it too. We often assume that the story of Noah is a good story for children, with its talk of animals and boats and even rainbows at the end. So it seems a wee bit kind of cuddly and, and a good story. And yet it's anything but. It's actually a story about destruction and quite a cruel story about the whole thing being destroyed because God is displeased with the way his creation is going. Not really a good story for children. I suppose I ought to lay my cards on the table here and say I don't see this as a factual historical account. I don't believe it happened. It may well refer to a time when there was a cataclysmic flood of some kind because several ancient cultures have stories of a similar nature where they reap God's judgment into it maybe on them or on other people. So maybe there was an event which they interpreted in that way. But to understand the full horror of it for its original hearers, we have to understand the way ancient Hebrews saw the universe. They saw it as a kind of bell jar shape. So there was water above, a dome above the earth, there was water underneath and the flat earth in between. So when God created the world, the, the creation narratives say, God separated the waters above from the waters below and made life possible. So when you understand it that way, you see how terrifying this prospect was. When the flood came, it literally was the sky falling in. It was the floodgates opening and the whole thing being undone, creation being reversed. The world had turned evil and God was going to destroy it and start again with one of each species to do it once more. So people who go searching for remains of the ark in Mount Ararat or elsewhere, to my mind, are missing the point altogether, and I doubt very much if they'll find much. The whole point, for me, is that it hasn't happened. It's a story of warning. It could happen at any moment, but it hasn't. Any civilization, including ours, lives at a knife edge all the time, where civilization and life itself could implode. And we court disaster by the way we treat people and creation. The whole point is, it hasn't happened yet. Somehow, by the grace of God, we survive and stay on the right side. And the rainbow is the promise that God won't do this. Like Noah, stay on the side of good and right, and God will bring you through on that vessel to a new day. But people saw God's judgment in events. And there are still those today who are keen to do that. They are keen to attribute the hand of God to all sorts of things. To show how displeased he is with something or other we may have done. Maybe there are some who see this pandemic as a kind of plague given in God's judgment over us. We are suffering this because we did such and such. Because we tolerated that thing. Now, of course, there is a link between doing something wrong and the consequences we suffer for that. But that's a very different thing from saying that God sends things to inflict on us, to judge us, to punish us in some way for what we've done. We ought to be very wary about that kind of thing because what kind of picture of God do such people have? There are two problems here for me, two basic problems. One is that it's a very arbitrary, blunt instrument to use to try and justify things which have happened. And there's a lot of collateral damage in the process. I can't imagine God working that way. Those of us who are old enough to remember the installation of David Jenkins as the Bishop of Durham will remember the fuss there was. Some people thought it was terrible he'd been appointed uh, because of his unorthodox views. So at the service, 
when he was to be installed in York Minster, people were going to protest and so on. And then lo and behold, the minster was struck by lightning. And they interpreted that as God's displeasure. God agreed with them. This man ought not to be the bishop. But the problem with taking that kind of line is, suppose, for example, some smaller church down the road, which was seemingly good and doing well, was struck by lightning or burnt down or some other disaster befell it. Then you've got to interpret it differently. Well, this is God testing our faith. Or maybe it's the devil attacking us to try and, and knock us off our route. You see, it all depends on your particular perspective. It's kind of like the woman during the war who said during an air raid, they prayed and prayed and God was good to them. All the bombs fell on the other side of town. What does that say about them on the other side of town? What would it say if another night the bombs fell on you? You see, it's nonsense, it's illogical, it's cruel. Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. I mentioned that last week in relation to moral things we do. But it's also true in this sense, if we were to judge people that way, and then something bad happens to us, we're going to be judged in the same kind of way when bad things happen. See, it's not neat and tidy, it's a very blunt instrument. This is the whole argument of the book of Job. Job is suffering affliction, and his friends, well-meaning friends, come along and say, look, Job, think, you must have done something to, to merit this. And Job says, no, I haven't. I'm no worse than the next guy. And in the end, he never did understand it, but he understood God was with him through it. See, we've got to be very careful about attributing God's judgment in that kind of way. But it doesn't seem to stop us. The second problem with this judgmental way is it's just not the way Jesus worked. In him, we see God's judgment on us. And it's the cross. God was in Christ, Paul says, but not raining down thunderbolts on us, not hammering folk for their wrongdoing, but God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself to seek out those who had gone wrong, to seek out those who were in a mess, to give us a second chance. He came not to judge the world, but to save it. That's the good news. To save it and us from ourselves. That's God's way revealed in Christ. So the world is a minefield of troubles. It is a potential disaster waiting to happen. It could be climate change. Nuclear conflagration, disease, famine, you name it. But God provides the ark, his way of love, to navigate us through it. To invite us back home to his ways. And the rainbow is a sign of hope that it won't and doesn't happen that way. Here's Jesus' take on it. A reading from the Gospel of St John. Chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who has faith in him may not perish, but have eternal life. It was not to judge the world that God sent his Son into the world, but that through him the world might be saved. No one who puts faith in him comes under judgment, but the unbeliever has already been judged because he has not put his trust in God's only son. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world but people preferred darkness to light because their deeds were evil. Wrongdoers hate light and avoid it for fear their misdeeds should be exposed. Those who live by the truth come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that God 
is in all they do. Amen. Despite all that I've said about judgment earlier, there is a link between things that happen and judgment. And if we're thinking people at all, we can't help but look at life and the things that happen and seek understanding. So while I don't believe for a minute that COVID-19 is some kind of plague sent to punish us for some misdemeanor, I do think it judges a lot of our attitudes and ways. And a lot of the things we do require re-examination. For those who heard the story of Noah long ago, they would be confronted by questions about their own life. What is important? What's right and wrong? What does God require of us? What could they do better? And what's leading them down a road to disaster? And when Noah emerged from the ark, he had to look at these things and think about how to rebuild. Can we not see some of that in this current crisis, it asks many questions of us of what we are and what we do. So it's not judgment in the sense of some people have gone wrong, therefore God will hammer everybody, but it does judge our values. What really matters in life? Is it entertainment and endless distraction and busyness, or has forced inactivity? made us re-evaluate what we chase? Does it not judge our materialism, the conspicuous consumption of which we have been guilty? Is stuff really that important? Or do we not see much more clearly that it's health and family and seeing friends? These are the things that matter and need our attention. Who do we value? Is it the great and the good? Celebrities? What is it? Shelf stackers, delivery drivers, health workers from top to bottom, from the, the most brilliant consultant to the humblest cleaner. We see now the role that people play. Has it not highlighted the inequalities in society? I mean, it's true to say that for people like me, who live in a lovely place with lots of open space, with plenty of choices, lockdown's not been a terrible hardship compared to somebody living in poverty, where it's much harder. Does it not judge what we do with creation? The environment can breathe again because we're not polluting it the way we did. Now we like to travel and do all these things, of course we do, but maybe we need a change in behaviour. Does it not judge our society, which is keener to open pubs than churches? Does it not judge the church itself? What we do, what have we got to say to our world about what is important? How do we say it? How do we communicate that message? About 20 years ago, our church, the Church of Scotland, produced a radical report called Church Without Walls. It was spoken about and debated and read and some things were done, but not huge differences resulted. Now, thanks to a virus, we've been forced to leave our walls, to become something different and think through what it means to be the church in a different way. Is it God's judgment? Or is it just a not-so-gentle nudge that we need it to push us on to make some changes, which we may need to keep beyond this? 
So for all that I don't believe in a heavy-handed, vengeful kind of judgment, as some might see, judgment is there in the story of Noah. It's saying, the way you're carrying on is inviting disaster. Do you want to go down that route and open the floodgates, or do you want to turn back and start coming board to a different way? To a different way of doing and being and thinking and believing the way of Jesus Christ, which is a way that promises life in abundance. The core message is God so loved the world, not just one or two people in it, but God so loved the world, his world, that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus certainly does judge us. When you look at Christ, I know I see I need to change. And you see where you need to change, even if you don't always do it. When we turn to his light, sometimes it's so bright compared to our darkness, it hurts our eyes. This is the judgment of love, which invites us back to enter the light, to follow him in a new way. Not a vengeful, destructive God, but a loving, redeeming God. In our prayers for the world and for other people today, rather than me leading spoken prayers, members of the congregation have sent in short prayers they would like to offer, which will appear on the screen during the singing of Psalm 23. And it's in a version by Stuart Townend, played and sung by Hazel Murch, Karen Kelman and William McSween. The Lord's my shepherd. Good. 
So all our prayers, Lord, we offer through Jesus Christ, who taught us these words to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever. Amen. Thank you to everyone who sent in prayers to use today, and thank you to Karen, Hazel and William for that lovely version of Psalm 23. Next week, as usual, we'll be doing the online service, which will go live at 10.30. We're also doing a messy church, which will go out at 11.30, and they'll both be there on the YouTube channel uh, beyond that, so you can access them at any time. So please join us for either or both of them. Our final hymn today is 519, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. today I would like to use part of an affirmation from South Africa written by Alan Bosak. It is not true that this world and its inhabitants are doomed to die and be lost. This is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. 
It is not true that we must accept inhumanity and discrimination, hunger and poverty, death and destruction. This is true. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It is not true that violence and hatred shall have the last word and that war and destruction have come to stay forever. This is true. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, in whom all authority will rest, and whose name will be Prince of Peace. And so the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May